Um, so let's start by talking about Triumph of the Will, and if you could talk, first of all, about the importance of, of the film itself and then what it meant well, to Lenny. Um, Triumph of the Will is one of, of five films that she made for the Third Reich. You heard her say in here, it was six days out of my life. Uh, and that was part of her post-war approach to it, that why should I, the re why should I spend 101 years, <laughs> which is how long she lived, why should I spend 101 years apologizing for six days that I spent making what was, in fact, not a political film at all, but an artistic film uh, that I did because of someone about whom I had an idea he was in politics. I wasn't quite sure what he did, <laughs> but I, I knew that it was something worthwhile. So, I mean, there is so much l loaded in, in what you just heard that is part of her personality and what I try to deal with in the book that I, it becomes very tangled and complicated but the simple way to cut through it, I think, is the way virtually everyone that I interviewed in Germany or elsewhere who had known her and had worked with her started off the interview with the same joke. And the joke was, she only lies when her mouth is open. <laughs> I heard, I can't tell I heard this in English, I heard it in French, I heard it in German, uh, and I heard it over and over again these people really meant it. So what, what you need to understand about Triumph of the Will is that it's one of five films. There was, it's, a, of course, a film about the Nazi Party rally in Nuremberg, but it's not the first of those films that she made. It's the second. And there was another that would follow after Triumph of the Will. But Triumph of the Will was a full-length feature. It was distributed commercially. It was in distribution throughout the entirety of the Third Reich into 1945 as the bombs were falling and the cinemas were collapsing around the spectator's shoulders. But it was its political aims were recognized so clearly by Hitler that no other Hitler film was ever made after this because one Need not, n n no one needed another one. But when he annexed Austria in 1938, this film was immediately put into 17 theaters in metropolitan Vienna in anticipation of the sort of fake plebiscite that was held so that the Austrians could vote yes to their own annexation as part of the Third Reich. So that's within the, the same week of the plebiscite. Hitler made sure that this film was on 17 metropolitan screens in Vienna. So what Lainey Riefenstahl's assignment was, was not how to aestheticize a political rally, something that any cameraman from MSNBC can do <laughs> and will do, you know, a year from September or whatever, it was how to aestheticize the Fuhrer and all that that means when everybody in Germany is a little bit shaky about how are we supposed to move forward with somebody that we know has just murdered half of the people, including, and this, is, this was so well known, I don't know, the analogy would be something like George Bush and Karen Hughes, it was so well known that Ernst Grumm, the head of the stormtroopers, was purported to be the only member of the Nazi party who was on a do basis with Hitler rather than the Z hmm. basis, the, the U plural. Hmm. And two months before this is filmed, Hitler had him murdered. So that's what Triumph of the Will, that's the subtext of Triumph of the Will, is that Triumph of the Will is the movie she made to make Hitler safe for Germany. That's a really long answer. I'm, I'm well, sorry, what but, it, but I think yeah. that's how, what you have to know when you look at all of this. Yeah, what it, what it gets at, and what I, I want to ask you before we get into what was Lenny Riefenstahl's attraction to Hitler, because it seemed like, like she was really drawn to him and everything about her personality and her own artistic ambition drew her to Adolf Hitler. 
let's talk a little bit about your work as, as biographer. Because you did a book, you've done three biographies now. You did one on Moss Hart. You did a book on Marlena Dietrich, which I guess in a way might have led you to wanting to do this book. Um, and then talk about, since everything out of Lenny Riefenstahl's mouth, as you established, is a lie, and your book is all about getting at the truth, um, what was the material that you found to work with that let you, you get to this? So what drew you to doing this project? And then what did you have to work with that would kind of let you get at the truth? Uh, Dietrich was the entrance into, yeah. the, into the subject because the uh, odd coincidence is that Marlena Dietrich and Lainey Riefenstahl were born just eight months apart in, in almost con, you know, contiguous neighborhoods. Of Berlin. In Berlin. Yeah. Yeah, and they had uh, very, very similar early careers. They were both sexually liberated. They were both, you know, great looking. They both were violently ambitious. Um, and they sort of came together. Uh, they, were, they were neighbors. They knew each other a little bit. Mm. Uh, and I had written this book about Dietrich. I had studied as a film school stu student with... Joseph von Sternberg, I had done my PhD thesis on Joseph von Sternberg, who had discovered Dietrich and made The Blue Angel and a bunch of other, of other movies. Um, and uh, Lady Riefenstahl's name kept coming up. Uh, and I talked with Dietrich, and Dietrich uh, thought that Lady Riefenstahl was a contemptible person, and she just laughed about her whenever her name came up. And part of the reason was that Lainey Riefenstahl had it in her head and in her memoirs <laughs> and in many interviews that if Marlena Dietrich had not been chosen for the Blue Angel, it would have been she, Lainey Riefenstahl. Mm -hmm. Now, what Lainey Riefenstahl forgot was <laughs> that one reason Dietrich was chosen to sing Falling in Love Again in that movie was because she could sing. And the other reason was because she could speak English, neither one of which Lainey Riefenstahl could do. So it is really a stretch, and I, I think it's perfectly conceivable that Joseph von Sternberg went to Berlin, met Lenny Riefenstahl, and said, listen, have dinner with me, and let's talk about your future. This is possible. The idea yeah. that she could have been uh, Dietrich's competition for that is, is, is absurd, but that sort <laughs> of is how... That sort of is how I got into it. From so that explains the fascination with her, but then you have, to, you have to write the book and you have to do the research. So what was it that made you think that you can get beyond this, this wall of denial and, and lies? And, and it's almost like you're watching a lawyer uh, when you're looking at Lenny Riefenstahl one talk of the, about herself. One of the things was the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Hmm. Because I knew that there was documentation the denazification hearings that you you saw uh, some reference to in this film, the denazification hearings for for Riefenstahl were over by 1950, but the uh, documentation about her career and about her relationship with the people in the party has been trickling out ever since then, and much of it has been in a, a flood since the fall of the Berlin Wall because so much of the paperwork was being was held by the Russians, hmm. the Russians who knew that it, they had it, but who were being mum about it, saying absolutely nothing uh, about it. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is 1989, that stuff started to trickle back. And uh, there are still diaries of Goebbels, for instance, that no German knew existed because they were all in Moscow. And there are diaries that are still being translated uh, and uh, put into book form in Munich at the Institute for Contemporary History. And I was able to get access to those things because I live in Germany part of the time and partly because I was just dogged yeah. and wanted to go after it. Um, there, I, I had some lucky breaks where I came upon uh, documentation that uh, was uh, uh, not available to anyone else and and that was very lucky but the most recent things that are in the book are things that actually came to physical light when she turned a hundred years old in 2002 
uh, and not all of the documentation uh, has yet been sifted and evaluated, and there may be some minor little chapters yet to reconsider about her life. Uh, but the, so much of it was because, A, the Germans were famously good at keeping records, <laughs> uh, suicidal, right. though that may be, and that because they were so bureaucratic that when they were doing something for a nefarious reason, they said so in the documentation. Um, the, an example for that is the Olympic film. The Olympic film, which to the end of, you, you need to understand, that to the end of Lenny Riefenstahl's life, she made money off the Nazis. Hmm. She continued to earn royalties from Triumph of the Will hmm. and from the Olympic films and the other films that she made. But she continued to maintain to the end of her life that the party had nothing whatever to do with her film about the films about the Olympics of 1936, all of which is untrue. The film is totally financed by the Nazi party. And there is this documentation in which it says, I can't give you the exact wording, it's in the book if you care to look it up, and in quotes and with footnote citations and so on, where the documents actually say, we have set up the Laney Riefenstahl Film Company as a blind so that no one will know the Nazi <laughs> party is financing the film. So, but this is part of that German bureaucratic right. and record keeping mentality. Well, none of those records were available. They were not available to the courts that let Re Laney off with a, a mere fellow traveler or, or sympathizer um, a judgment. 